Neogen. So let me get started here and get everything pulled up. How are we looking? Can we see that? Yep, looks great. Perfect. So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, mainly German roaches. We will have a couple of other uh, roaches for our honorable mentions uh, from what we'll go over today. Uh, first thing, kind of a little overview. I will talk about the importance, why, why it's so important to know about German roaches and what makes them so important. Uh, some of their characteristics and their identification uh, factors about them. I'll go over some successful traits and then go a little bit more into detail on their life cycle. Uh, some different foraging and nutrient requirements. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of our lookalikes and honorable mentions uh, of your German roach. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the lost art of reading insect monitors. Uh, and then we'll go over a few of the different types of treatments. And then lastly, we'll come together for a little conclusion. Uh, so to start it out, why are German roaches one of the most important species of uh, roaches to know about. Uh, for one, they cause and spread the most house risks out of any uh, roach that is structure infesting. Uh, they are the third leading cause of asthma in children, and they can spread many different diseases vectors. Uh, they uh, can spread over 2,000 strains of salmonella. Uh, so there's a lot of things that they can be there in, in very gross environments, you know, very unsanitary, uh, and that's just going to breed, you know, a lot of that disease and bacteria that can get spread to you. And uh, the way that it spreads is going to be through uh, their their cast shed skins, uh, their uh, feces, you know, uh, all of that is going to be, you know, ways that they can spread diseases. Uh, two, there's virtually no seasonal difference. German roaches are alive because of us. They live in man-made structures. Uh, so because of that, you're not going to have any seasonal difference. In the winter, when it gets colder, activity is going to stay the same. You know, And that's the same as in the summer as well. When it gets warmer, their activity levels will stay the same. Uh, they're all indoors, so there, there is no seasonal, seasonal factor. Uh, they can reproduce exponentially more than any other uh, structure infesting roach. Uh, so the female uh, will lay anywhere from four to six uthekas, which is their egg sac, uh, and each one of their uthekas will have anywhere from 30 uh, to 48 eggs in it. You know, and because of that, they can reproduce you know, much quicker you know, than a lot of your other insects. So uh, because of that, if you were to transport one uh, pregnant female roach into a facility, it can turn into a full-blown infestation. Uh, in like a half a year. It doesn't take very long at all uh, for a problem to arise. Uh, and lastly, they're the most frequently encountered roach and they generate the most callbacks. Uh, if you get called for a roach problem, majority of the time it's going to be a German roach, you know, or uh, an American or Oriental roach, which is usually the other two that you will encounter. Uh, about 75% of your callbacks will be associated to German roaches. Uh, the other will be you know, about 15% will be your, your American roaches and a little bit more of your, your uh, Oriental roaches, about 3% or so. Uh, German roaches, they come from the order Blatidae. Uh, you'll see a lot with uh, your insects. The Greek term for them is going to be how they got their name. Blada and Blatidae, that's Greek for roach, and that's kind of how you get um, it's it's fancy name there. Uh, it's about 13 to 16 millimeters long. Uh, just as a reference, 10 millimeters is a centimeter long. Uh, they are omnivorous, meaning that they will eat both plant and animal origin. Uh, they got broad, flattened bodies, and their wings are going to be flat and pretty leathery as well. Uh, their wings, they, they don't fly with them. Instead, they, they use them for other matters, uh, such as balance. Uh, so their wings are kind of their counterbalance, and if they're moving, you'll see their wings kind of shift a little bit, and that's kind of you know, their counter. That's uh, where they can move so quickly. Uh, it also helps them squeeze into really tight spaces just because it's that leathery feel, and it's not like scales to where they can get caught up on it. Uh, they do have a hemimetabolous life cycle. Uh, that just means it's incomplete metamorphosis. Uh, it goes from egg, nymph, adult. Uh, there is no pupa. There's no larva stage. Uh, it's just your egg, nymph, adult. Uh, they prefer dark, damp, warm areas. 
and they live in clusters. Your German roaches are pretty cryptic. They're not going to be out in the open. They're going to be in the dark where it's uh, the out of sight, out of mind places, you know, and, and also very unsanitary uh, or usually very unsanitary. Uh, and then they're Utheka kind of going off the whole uh, Greek terminology. Uh, U in Greek means egg and Theka means a cover or container. Uh, so uh, Utheka in translation means an egg container, an egg case. So that's that's where you get Utheka from. And what that is, it's a it's brown. It's like a purse shaped and it's a light brown or tan in coloration. Uh, and the picture, you can see it right there uh, next to uh, that nymph or that adult there. Uh, it, that egg casing is broken. And when they get broken, they get a little bit more translucent. Uh, but, you know, if, when you find them, it's usually going to be, you know, open, probably not hashed if you're doing any kind of treatments. You know, but that's your Utheka. Uh, German roaches are known to have, you know, the two black horizontal stripes on their pronotum. I, I call this personally, that's, uh, that's their mohawk. Um, a lot of your roaches can, you know, be determined or not fully determined, but uh, you can point the finger in their direction a lot of times based off of the patterns that are on the back of their pronotum. Uh, and just in this case with your German roach, it's going to have two stripes. A lot of the nymphs will also have uh, the two stripes on their back as well. Uh, they got slender antenna. Uh, it is segmented, but it's segmented so small you can't really tell uh, from the pictures. Um, but, it, you know, because of that, it looks very segmented or uh, it looks very uh, slender antenna uh, just from the naked eye. Uh, the the Circe, uh, what, what the Circe are, it's a multi-segmented uh, appendage or it's a pair of appendages. You can kind of see them on the back of the, the roach there. Uh, and then your, your nymphs, they're almost black in color. You will still see the mohawk on the nymphs, but they are almost black you know, versus your light brown uh you know color and then uh your immatures have developing wing pads on their thorax uh, and you can see that with the the nymph on the very top there where it has like the wings that are they're developing on it uh some of the successful traits about german roaches and their life cycle and why they're so you know they're so good uh one is the number of eggs per their utheka we had talked about before that there's anywhere from 30 to 48 eggs in an utheka uh, and they, a, a female will lay around six in her lifetime. So, and that's going to be anywhere from four to six weeks, uh, depending on uh, the living conditions that she's in. Um, because of that, you know, infestations happen very quickly, you know, and one female can turn into a lot in a short amount of time. Uh, they have a short developmental period. Uh, they have the shortest developmental period from hatching to sexual maturity out of any uh, roach there is. Uh, the nymphs oh, behind. Uh, the nymphs are smaller than most uh, other species of roaches. Uh, it allows them to conceal themselves in many places that are inaccessible uh, to us or predator species like a mouse. And it also makes it a lot more difficult to inspect for them and find so they can uh, be, get a problem under the radar. Uh, females carry the Utheka as it develops. This one's pretty unique and it, it's really cool. Uh, when the female has an Utheka, uh, it it uh, it doesn't really eat, it doesn't do much, and it kind of stays hidden. Uh, when uh, while it's hiding, you know, it, it like I said, it won't eat much, and that Utheka is going to kind of be extended here on the rear. Her wing pads don't extend that far, so you will see the majority of the Utheka. And about 24 to 48 hours uh, before that Utheka hatches, she'll actually go back into hiding uh, pretty close to the nest and then drop that Utheka. And um, most of your other roaches, they're going to drop it like a week before they're going to hatch and they're going to drop it wherever they're at. You know, if they're walking in the middle of the floor, that that egg casing is just going to drop if it's ready to go. The German roaches, they're very good mothers. They're not going to do that. They're going to take that egg casing, they're going to take it back to their home and then drop that egg casing. Uh, the results of that is you're going to have you know, a lot of nymphs in the population for one, because all the nymphs are hatching there. Uh, about 80% of your roach population is, is going to consist of nymphs. And that's a big reason why. 
Um, but uh, because of that, a lot of your roaches are going to become adults. You know, they're going to be out of the danger. They're going to be, you know, in front of everybody. They're not going to be out in the open, you know, where the elements are. Uh, and then as a result of all of this, the nymphs aggregate close to the female at the times of hatching. Uh, it kind of keeps them away from danger. So uh, going on their foraging and nutritional requirements, uh, they're not very good at finding food. Uh, they can only find food and water uh, that's only about a few centimeters away. When they do find it, you know, it's going to be usually by chance and they'll lay the pheromones to show everybody else where there is food and water. Uh, so pheromones is really going to be how they communicate uh, when, when they find, you know, certain things, then they will lay their pheromones. Excuse me. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the females that have their utheca, uh, they're not going to feed. They'll feed very minimally, just enough to stay alive. Uh, because of that, the bait that you're using, your females aren't going to eat your bait. Uh, so you're going to have to have, you know, probably a dust or a, a liquid uh, kind of treatment just to even reach, you know, the, the female that's carrying the utheca. When she drops that, she'll go back to eating and, and being normal again. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when you're treating. Uh, access to water is much more important than food. And so if you, one of the reasons that you're going to see roaches around uh, motors, one, because they're warm, but it's also because of condensation. It gets a lot of moisture built up around, you know, like motor housing, you know, and that's going to attract a lot more rodents, you know, because they are searching for water you know, more than they're searching for food. Uh, they prefer carbs to fats and proteins, and animal proteins will be almost completely ignored unless they're food deprived. Uh, so this one's actually pretty interesting. Protein is needed for German roaches to survive, but the longevity drops uh, the more protein that they have in their diet. Uh, you had seen in this previous slide uh, the entire life cycle. It's completed in about 100 days. If you ask anybody about how long a German roach will live, they're going to tell you a different time. And that's because of how much protein and carbs is in their diet. Uh, the more protein they have, the longevity drops. Uh, so females that are like, uh, if you were to have German roaches with about a, a 15 to 25% protein diet, then they can live for about 270 days. So that's like the high end and optimal conditions if they have what they need to eat. If they feed on just a straight 90% or so protein diet, they're gonna live for about 74 days. And so right there you have a 200 day variance of how long German roaches can live for. And uh, so in, in, uh, in human habitats where they do live, protein is gonna be usually what's available, uh, not carbs. And because of that, that's where you get the average life cycle of a German roach, you know, in, in our terms, about a hundred days, but it can be much, much more and it can be less. Uh, common misidentification. Uh, you guys got this there in Texas. I, I live more up north, it's colder, uh, so we don't have uh, Asian cockroaches. Uh, don't get them mixed up with oriental cockroaches. They're different, completely different species. Uh, your Asian cockroach is almost an exact mirror copy of your German cockroach. And so to know the difference or the best way to tell the difference between the two is their habits. What are they eating? Where did you find them? Your Asian cockroach, it's, it lives outside, uh, lives in leaves, brushes, tree stumps. It can live you know, and your mulch, uh, and they're, they're feeding primarily on plant material. Uh, and they live in warmer climates. Uh, and until recently, they were only found in five different states in the U.S., and that's the southern states like Florida, Georgia, uh, Texas. You know, those states is where you would find the Asian cockroaches. And, and as the earth is getting warmer, they are going to, you know, kind of move more north, you know, but it is important to know, you know, the difference between them. Uh, they are very strong flyers, so they use their wing pads, and they are attracted to light. Uh, so if you are at night, at nighttime, you have the lights on and a window open, you can get Asian cockroaches flying inside. They're not going to structure, they're not a structure infesting pest. Um, I find it be very difficult for them to even be able to breed indoors. Uh, so if they are inside, they don't want to be there. Uh, they... 
will want to go outside. So if you have, you know, window open during the day, they might find their way back out. Uh, one of the only appearance differences is you'll find it in females that are carrying an utheca. You'd seen on the German cockroach, the utheca extends, but like three quarters of your utheca will be visible. That's uh, because their wing pads aren't that long but in the asian roach they're a lot longer so they're gonna almost completely hide the utheca underneath their wings so because of that you know, you're usually not going to see you know the utheca or the mothers so two uh, honorable mentions uh, there's going to be the other two that you come in contact on the field most often your american cockroach and your oriental cockroach uh, the american cockroach is, is going to be one of your bigger ones uh, that you'd find inside of a house it's going to be, you know, four centimeters long, uh, and they will have, you know, any, that that halo, you know, on the back of their head. Uh, there are other roaches that have this halo, so it's not unique to the American cockroach, like like the Australian cockroach. If you ran into that, they also have the halo on the back of their pronotum, but their nymphs have a very unique pattern on their back where American cockroaches don't. And then you have your oriental cockroach. Uh, they're very dark, very shiny black in color. Uh, they're usually going to be living on just the outside of your, your structure and, and mulch. Uh, they are peridomestic. You know, so they live on the exterior of human habitats. You know, but the oriental cockroach, you know, they can come inside. Both of these um, cockroaches are capable of breeding indoors, and they are structure-infesting pests. You know, so it is important to know uh, these two just to kind of better understand what you're dealing with, you know, wh where you'd be treating and inspecting for these guys are going to be a lot different than German roaches. So the treatment process, starting your whole process, now that we know, you know, kind of the life cycle, uh, some of the habits of German roaches, let's put that to good use. Uh, starting with our, our treatment process with identification. Identification can't be stressed enough. It should be first in all treatments, regardless of the pest. You, know, you have to start with identification and know what you're dealing with. Uh, next, I mean, inspect all areas that may have German roach activity. Uh, three, gauge the level of activity. Uh, and four, treat all areas with activity. You know, to treat, remembering to treat near the harborage areas. Uh, I'm going to kind of brush over these because we will go through everyone in more detail you know, throughout the slides, but you kind of need to have uh, your action plan before going in. And the first one starts with, you know, identification. And with identification, you need to know inspection, what to look for, you know, and to know uh, when you're going and inspecting for German roaches. Uh, for one, you need to know your site. You need to know the micro environments, you know, such as like a, around a sink. You know, that's going to be a, a lot different environment than outside of the sink. So you need to know those areas that are going to attract German roaches. Uh, you need to know uh, the sensitive areas, preferred harbages. Um, in order to do that, you're going to need to get down and look up. You know, it's going to be key. You know, I mentioned in the beginning, German roaches, they like to live in out of sight, out of mind places, live in dark, dark areas that um, are, are warm, moist spots, you know, like your motor housings. Uh, you're going to have to move equipment to optimize inspections. If this is in a kitchen, which it usually is, uh, you will have to move some things. You, you will have to move a fridge out of the way, a cooler, you know, take the stove and move it back so you can treat behind it or inspect, you know, so you will need to do that, um, you know, and, and if it is heavy, you know, then at least ask for help before completely giving up. Uh, you might need to remove some covers to expose electrical housing. This includes outlet covers, you know, so you might need to do that, you know, while you're inspecting and treating. Uh, some examples of where you can inspect or some places that get missed, uh, hollow legs of tables. I've seen many times where some of my technicians would be out in a job and not even know that some of the table legs were hollow on the inside and you'd open it up or a little plastic cap on the end and look in there and you'd see German roaches all over. Uh, inside of motor housings, uh, sometimes you can't get in to motor housings, depending on your facility, you might need, you know, some kind of electrician or engineer, you know, or somebody that works there to open it up. Uh, behind and under appliances, uh, casters. Uh, if you don't know what casters are, it's a, a set of wheels that's uh, designed to have something set on top and pushed. 
You see this a lot with uh, your trash cans. A lot of your trash cans and facilities are going to have you know, a set of casters that you set it on top so you can push. Those casters get forgotten about all the time. They're a perfect spot for harborage. They got food, shelter, moisture, uh, everything that you would need for a perfect microenvironment for your German roaches to transfer to get from one place to another, hide, and just thrive. Uh, drop ceilings and inside beach bench seating. Uh, this is going to be mainly for like your, your restaurants. If you have a problem or an infestation that's bad enough or been there long enough, they're going to be in spots that you wouldn't necessarily think to inspect, like inside your beach bench seating uh, and drop ceilings. Uh, you, you also get this with somebody who fogs. Uh, if they fog, it pushes them in areas that you wouldn't inspect it expect it sorry i can't talk this morning uh and because of that you do need to be vigilant you know when you are inspecting you know so it wouldn't hurt to just take a peek in a drop ceiling uh throw a monitor up there uh just to try and see if anything is there you know if you find any activity uh, so if we're in a food establishment some of the places that you would find German areas and, and some that you definitely need to be you know, aware of, uh, behind and underneath kitchen appliances can mainly be for your break room. You know, it'd be like underneath your sink as well. Uh, food, trash carts, break rooms, locker rooms, shelves and coolers where lunch boxes are stored. Uh, German roaches are hitchhikers. They're not going to travel outside just crawling on the ground from one house to the other. They're gonna get brought in from a lunchbox, from somebody's coat. You know, that's how they travel from one place to another. And, and knowing that you can kind to you can kind of limit where you're going to inspect first. You can also uh, determine if there is going to be activity in a certain spot, where is it going to occur first? They get brought in, so it's gonna probably go to where they're storing the lunch boxes and the coolers. You know, or where they're putting all their clothes or their lunchbox inside of their locker. There's going to be the spots that where they get to first. And then from there, they'll move on to where, you know, they'll they want to be at inside of you know, a vending machine or um, an, an ice maker, you know, or whatever it is in your situation. Uh, so we get called to uh, this commercial kitchen uh, for inspecting and you have no info about this place other than you have a call for German roaches here. I'm going to give you a few seconds to look. Just in your mind, uh, tell me some spots that you think a German roach would be and where you'd want to inspect first. Now remember, German cockroaches prefer to live in dark, damp, warm locations, and they travel by hitchhiking. So some of the spots I'd hope you'd picked out behind this warmer, you'd want to check there underneath the sink, uh, behind that refrigerator, underneath the stove. Uh, there's inside that motor housing compartment there in the bottom, around that fryer, uh, the drop ceiling. All of these are areas that German roaches can be hiding in. So um, I mean, these are the spots that you need to have in your mind uh, when going uh, to some kind of job, you know, when you're out in the field. Uh, so you, you look for these areas, you want to kind of determine how bad a problem is, you want to know more info about it. You know, what the way that you do that is with insect monitors. Uh, personally, I don't think insect monitors get used enough. I don't see how I used to have technicians that would try and leave without having any insect monitors. And I don't know how you could do uh, pest control without it um, because with your insect monitors you can tell things you know like identifying the pests that you're dealing with you can identify harborages you can determine infestation levels you can save time on inspections you can save time on future inspections uh, there are just so many benefits to insect monitors that you know get forgotten about and you know, we will go over those too uh, some remember too is when you are dealing with insect monitors date and initial every monitor you know they must be accounted for uh, in some facilities you need to create temporary maps which includes the number of monitors and where they were placed and it's going to be in like your food and audited facilities you know some places you, you don't really need to do that but others it's required to uh, don't place them where they can get wet and dirty 
Uh, don't place them where they'll be cleaned up and moved. You know, the, these are kind of obvious things. Don't place them, you know, to where they're seen from the open eye to where just a regular customer going in to eat at an establishment, you know, and they see German roaches, you know, you don't want to have that. So kind of think is the aesthetics of it too. Uh, Follow-ups, I recommend doing it every week. Um, why weekly? With German roaches, infestation levels can change very quickly from week to week. You know, so it's important to keep tabs on it you know, and make sure you're keeping an eye on the infestation level and the activity levels. Uh, places that you'd want to set your monitors, going out to this same scenario, to the same place, kind of seeing a trend in the same spots that we looked at is going to be the same spots that we're placing our monitors, you know, near the likely garbage areas on the shelves, floors adjacent to the walls or vertical surfaces. Uh, vertical surface, what I mean by that, like underneath the sink here, uh, sometimes there's like a flashing you can put uh, that monitor behind. It's out of sight. It's where German roaches would be. Uh, sometimes you might need something to fasten it to the side. Or, or to the wall, you know, but those are the areas like uh, underneath the stove, like here you'd probably take off that little flashing and put it behind there. Uh, in this instance, uh, places you want to put them is like right there in the open, right next to the pots and pans in the kitchen, um, on the sink, you know, some places that you want it, you know, they get dirty, mess, messed up, cl uh, cleaned up, you know, they are open, you know, just anybody can see it. Those are the spots that you don't want to place it at. I uh, don't want to set them directly up against heat sources. So if you do have it in like a stove or a warmer, a fryer, try and avoid the heat. Uh, these monitors are adhesives and those adhesives can melt, you know, so you can get all your glue on the bottom and you kind of ruin your trap as well and it can be pointless. So and then also just a uh, uh, don't place it out in the open because then there's a cross contamination concern. Uh, so some of the benefits of uh, your insect monitors. I want to talk about reading your monitors. I want to have a little activity. Uh, so we set monitors out in our facility. We come back and we see this. What does this tell us uh, with German roaches on our insect monitors? All right, here on the left, I'll give you a few seconds to look at it and see what's there. Uh, what does this tell you on this insect monitor? This one simply tells you the harbor is to the left of the track. It can tell you something as simple as just the direction of where to look. Here on the right, you see a whole bunch of adults. You don't see very many nymphs at all, maybe one or two. So what that tells you that there's usually a recent introduction of incoming goods and that a lot uh, had gotten transported. Uh, your adults are going to be the first ones to get transported. Your nymphs, as we had heard before, about 80% of your population is going to be nymphs. And they, stand, or they, they tend to stay in the middle of the heart you know, of your colony. And because of that, adults are going to be the ones that generally get transported. Uh, and so if you see in your monitor just a bunch of adults, no nymphs, you probably got something that just came into your facility. Uh, here on the left, not many adults, but tons and tons of nymphs. Tells you that a nearby harbor has recently became overcrowded. Uh, so your your population, going back to what I just said with 80% being nymphs, if it gets overpopulated, the nymphs are going to be one of the first ones to get pushed out of facility. If it gets to this point, you are dealing with a healthy population. If it's enough that a, a nearby harbor has became overcrowded, you know, but because of that, it's telling you that for one, you're near a harborage, uh, but two, you got a little bit bigger problem than what you thought, you know, and you definitely need, you know, to take care of that. Uh, here on the right, you know, this one has adults, nymphs in all stages uh, here on the right. Uh, this one tells you that you have a very mature population, you know, that if you see this, you should be concerned. You have all stages of roaches on all sides of the trap. Uh, so it's it's very concerning. Uh, so these last two here, the one on the far left, got many adults, but you see something that you haven't seen on the other insect monitors, and that's Uthacus. Uh, so 
with IGRs, I know we haven't talked about this much yet, uh, but with IGRs, it will cause females uh, to prematurely drop their egg sacs. Uh, so what this tells you is that IGRs have been used um, and just to uh, keep using IGRs because it's working. Uh, and then the last one here on the right just looks like a battlefield of, of roach parts. Tells you that you might have American roaches or mice present. So it tells you that you might have a predator species uh, that is eating some of your German roaches. Your adult mice, if it's a brand new trap, maybe not. Uh, but a lot of times can walk on top of uh, your glue boards or at least pick at the ends of it um, or like stand on the edge and pick at some of the roaches on the glue board. You know, they, they will do that. And American roaches can do that too. With American roaches, you typically want glue trays and not like insect monitors uh, just to catch them. You know, but, but like I said, you can tell a lot with insect monitors. And I think, you know, that they need to be used more often. It should be a common practice especially with German roaches. Uh, so just uh, some added help when you're inspecting. Be like using the flusher. This is not a treatment. It's an inspection tool. And it's to help you find German roach harborages. Uh, so an instance of a useful spot that you could use it would be like shown here in the picture in between your stove and a counter. Uh, sometimes you can't really get a flashlight light to get in there and inspect it properly. Uh, so you'd have to use a flushing agent, squirt it in there, and um, usually what your flushing agents are, it's straight pyrethroids, and it's if you squirt a roach, it's going to look like you set it on fire. They go nuts. You know, they will come rushing out. It's kind of why they call it flushing. Uh, one thing to note, if you are using flushing agents in any spot that you do spray a flushing agent on, don't treat over it. Uh, flushing agents can be detected by all insects. That includes German roaches. You know, so if you bait on top of it or spray on top of it, your German roach isn't going to go near it. They're all residuals. They're all going to leave a scent, and they will you know, stay away from it. Uh, so then it just says reminder. Don't don't use flushers as treatments. It's one, it's not according to label, it's expensive. And two, you're just gonna limit yourself and your treatment later, you know, the more that you use your flusher. You know, so it is just an inspection tool. Uh probably your number one treatment uh, that you would use would be baiting. Uh, this, in my opinion, is the best option in almost every situation. And because the reason. Why I think that is because baiting is the only one that provides a secondary kill effect. Uh, what a secondary kill effect means, it's uh, roaches that eat other roaches, you know, frass uh, or dead roaches. If you know roaches, they do practice trophallaxis, uh, which if they vomit, others will eat it. Uh, but if they do that, then you can pass that active ingredient onto another roach, and it can get you another kill than the primary um, roach that ate the bait. Uh, every roach that feeds on bait has the potential to contaminate up to 40 other roaches. You know, and this is really great with German roaches because when they eat the bait, they'll want to go back towards the nest. You know, they'll go back there. If they die there, other roaches will feed on them and, and you can spread that AI across or active ingredient um, across the rest of the colony. Uh, you can treat all areas. So uh, some areas that you can't treat with other treatment methods you might be limited to, it'd be like an outlet covers. Uh, behind the back of appliances, you know, like motor housing units, uh, you can't really unload a B&G back there. You, you just can't. Uh, places that are damp, if you were to have a place that collects a lot of condensation, uh, you shouldn't have any kind of dust, liquid, nothing. But you can have, like one thing I used to do is do bait arenas, uh, like you know, just a plastic bait arena. And I'd set it down in places that get condensation and just squirt some bait on top of it as well. Uh, you know, if the bait arena was all gone, then it was great just to keep your bait uh, dry and not wet and moldy and gross. Uh, but because of that, you know, baiting, you, you can do it in a lot more situations than other treatment methods. Uh, you can apply it where it won't get cleaned up. Uh, you can, it's possible to treat in unsanitary conditions. Um, with this one, German roaches are going to be in some of the very gross 
spots, right? And like a restaurant, um, it gets very greasy, you know, and spots that they'll be at. If you were to treat on top of that, it's not going to allow for the active ingredient to get released. Uh, so because of that, you're, you're kind of just spraying, you know, in the wind. It's not going to do anything. Uh, and we're baiting. If you bait on top of it, that base is still going to be good. You know, that chemical is going to be able to get released and German roach should be able to get affected by it. You know, so that's one thing to keep in mind. There are certain sprays that you, or liquid treatments that you can spray on top of those surfaces and it will work, but most of them aren't going to. Uh, and then lastly, you can see results within a week. You know, some of the active ingredients in these uh, baits, uh, they will act quicker or you'll have a lesser concentration. So it can act a little bit uh, less, you know, give it more time to spread, you know, throughout the colony uh, before it starts to really take out some numbers of roaches. So whichever one you're going for, you can choose. Uh, so kind of going back uh, to this commercial kitchen and places that you'd want to place the bait, you know, like where and how you'd bait, it's the same places that we inspected, the same places that we've set our monitors out, it's going to be the same places that we treat. Uh, there's no, the reason why I keep going back to the same spots, there's no point in going out, you know, if there's nothing in the dining room, there's no point in treating the dining room, you know, or a bedroom, if it has no activity with German roaches, you want to stay with where the activity is, and you want to stay in the same spots, of course, you do want to inspect other areas. Uh, but when you find activity, you want to stay in those spots until it's gone. So, Excuse me. Yeah, some of your application uh, directions is going to be on your label, um, like with your uh, label of your roach baits. It'll usually tell you something to bait in pea size drops, approximately one to two inches apart from another. Uh, you don't want to line uh, your roach bait like it's caulk. You know, uh, if it's in an area like here in the picture, uh, you know, I've seen many times where they'll just take their roach bait and just spray it all the way across. Uh, not only is that a waste of roach bait, but in an area like this, when it gets hard and cracked like that, yes, it's still palatable to roaches. Yes, they can still eat it, but they probably won't because there's going to be something else available that's more fresh, that's more nutritious uh, than dried, hard, cracked roach bait. You know, so it is important you know, to only apply what you need and just to keep Keep tabs on it. You know, if it's dry and cracked, pick it up. Don't leave it there for the next guy. You know, make sure you are taking care of it. Uh, a small amount does go a very long way. So keep that in mind. Uh, bait applicators. Uh, a lot of technicians use these. Some don't. It's, it's your preference. Uh, bait applicators. You. This is uh, the sure kill one. You kind of see the the bait gun. Uh, that's probably your your more common one that uh, technicians will know more of. Uh, a lot of those are going to help with precise baiting. They'll have uh, metered parts on it, where you can get the same amount applied every time. It'll be bit. It'll be a little bit easier to record, you know, on your papers. Uh, it's easier to treat hard to reach areas. Uh, versus without an applicator. Without an applicator, you just need uh, the little syringe plunger. You can probably get a, a few inches or more in. With a gun, you can really get into the hard to reach areas uh, to apply uh, you know, the bait where you need it. Moving on to liquid applications. Uh, when I think of liquid applications for German roaches, I always look at it with the pros and cons. Uh, restrictions for liquid applications are getting tighter and tighter every year. You know, so I do think it's important uh, to know some of the dangers that can happen and just to be aware that, excuse me, and just to be aware that liquid applications are under the microscope and especially in certain, uh, certain uh, like audited facilities, you know, certain facilities, it's a lot more, you know, looked at. Some of the pros of liquid applications you get to choose the type of insecticide you want to use. Do you want to use a pyrethroid? You know, so you can take care of them pretty much on contact. You're killing what you spray. Uh, do you want to have a neonicotinoid where it's going to take just a little bit to get them? Or do you want like a chlorfenapyr type of active ingredient where it's going to take one to two weeks for you to really start noticing a dent? You know, you get to choose that. You can see results immediately or in a week, you know, you get to choose it all. 
You can cover a large area in a short amount of time. Uh, if you have a line full of vending machines, you can treat the whole wall in you know a few minutes. Um, yeah, you're still going to want to do other types of treatments along with it. You know, but it is a pro that your liquid applications don't take an hour. You know, just for for something simple. Uh, and then lastly, you can add IGRs into the mix, your insect growth regulators. Uh, some of your liquid concentrates will have IGRs already added in them, you know, but the ones that don't, you can pick uh, the insect growth regulator that you want to add, you know, or include, you know, in, in your mixture. Uh, some of the cons of your liquid applications, uh, you're unable to treat in all the areas that you would be like with bait, you know, or, or dust. Uh, you, you can't, spray in the back of motor housings. You can't spray in electrical um, areas. You know, so those are the places that you're kind of limited to. It's easily washed away. Uh, if you're spraying baseboards and you're in a restaurant, it's probably going to get washed away every night when they clean, you know, if they're cleaning it properly. Uh, or if you're just in a really unsanitary, dirty environment, uh, where you spray might get really dusty, you know, over the day and it won't be effective, you know, after a certain amount of time. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, your sprayer and applicator dependent. Uh, if your sprayer breaks, you can't treat. You know, at least with your bait, if your syringe breaks, you can still use something to get the bait out and uh, treat effectively. Uh, with your liquid applicator, if your sprayer is broken, you know, you can't really do anything else, right? Um, you know, if it's in the winter and you leave you might not have this problem in Texas, uh, but if it's in the winter and you leave your sprayer in, in the back of your truck and it, it gets frozen and expands your metal cracks, then you then you aren't doing a treatment that day. Uh, next is liquids easier to spread and contaminate. Uh, if it gets on your boot, you're probably going to be tracking that liquid or that uh, that chemical throughout the plant for uh, for a while on your the bottom of your boot can be traced. So. Uh, and then lastly, insects can develop a resistance over time. It's a little bit more important with German roaches than other insects, uh, just because they reproduce so quickly. Uh, about every four to six weeks, you get a new generation of German roaches. And insects develop a resistance by being exposed to certain insecticides over generations, usually pyrethroids. Um, and so with your liquid applications, you can have concentration rates. So how strong do you want your concentration of usually a pyrethroid in this case, we're gonna say, if you spray it and it's not a strong enough concentration and the German roach lives, then it's gonna, you know, it can develop resistance over time. You know, the, the offspring of that German roach will be a little bit resistant to pyrethroids. And if you get it again to where it doesn't die, but it does, Across, you know, part of your insecticide, then it develops more and more. Uh, you don't have to worry about that much with bait, you know, or, or, or dust. But with the liquid um, application, you have to worry a little bit about resistance. Uh, so we have a different kitchen here. Uh, and we go in here to treat for a liquid application. You know, where are some of the areas that we could apply a liquid treatment? You know, I'll give you a few minutes just to take a look at over it. So you are going to be limited more uh, with your liquid than your other treatments. Uh, some of the spots that would be a good place to treat would be like the, the baseboard next to the cooler, uh, behind the cooler itself. Uh, pull out the stoves if you can and, and treat behind the stoves. Uh, the baseboard next to the pantry, uh, you're not going to be treating the walls. You're not going to be treating the floors or you know inside the shelves themselves. You can't really treat that either. And it's also a, a good time to note um, the difference between a spot treatment and a crack and crevice treatment. Uh, and then what I usually see where you hit the gas and don't let up on the gas throughout the entire baseboard. Uh, that That is what most technicians will, will end up doing because it's easier, but that's not what you want to do. Uh, if you were to have it in this spot and just let loose on all the baseboards, then you do have a, a contamination concern. You know, so there's spots that you don't want to treat, um, you know, so keep that in mind. Uh, and then uh, this is a precautionary statement. I've seen too many times where, you know, uh, people will get in trouble because uh, they didn't apply it correctly. They didn't know um, where to apply it or how much they could apply. 
Uh, if you're in a building like a food manufacturing facility or one that's just uh, audited, it might be illegal to perform spot treatments while the plant is running. Uh, you could only do crack and crevice treatments until it dries, you know, or a spot treatment when the plant is down. And then when it dries, you know, they can go back in, um, you know, but it's all you know, refer to your label uh, with like entry rates, you know, or spot treatments. Uh, there will be different. Uh, language when it's like a residential versus a food and feed establishment, you know, so keep that in mind. Uh, don't spray near drains, avoid food contact areas. Uh, <clears throat> don't apply it in areas that would get cleaned up, you know, or that's on a regular sanitation schedule and then avoid you know, applying where foot traffic will be. Yeah, and then always apply according to label. Uh, talk a little bit about insect growth regulators. This is something that you should be using uh, anytime you're dealing with German roaches uh, and you use it in conjunction with treatments. Uh, and your IGRs, they do have some baits that have IGRs baked into it, um, but where you get the, the most benefit is going to be from your liquid uh, in insecticides. Yeah, and they are going to affect, like there's no secondary uh, effect when it comes to IGRs, it's only going to affect the primary uh, roach, but it does speed the process up immensely and it does help with other factors like the, the reproductive uh, capabilities uh, of the female adults. Uh, some of the benefits of your insect growth regulators and what that is, it's a, a juvenile hormone mimic. That's what all your IGRs are. Uh, it inhibits the growth or maturity of certain insect pests, and some of your IGRs are going to affect like the outside of an egg, or it's going to affect the middle, affect the brain, or or more uh, with reproductive. You know, so that's one of the benefits of one IGR versus another one. Uh, but it interferes with their molting process. Molting is uh, insects shedding their skin. They, you know. Most insects need to do that to continue to grow. Uh, German roaches are no different. And when they shed that skin to level up, I guess, uh, they won't be able to, and you'll see their, their wings twisted in a way. And uh, you can see that here in the picture. It also interferes with the reproductive development. Uh, when a female lays their egg, it's, it's gonna be dead. Like it's not gonna be able to hatch. This is why when you see your German roach problems, if you see an Utheka out in the middle of nowhere, then then you can pretty much say an IGR has been used. Um, but if you see a bunch of Uthekas, they probably will either be all hatched or all not hatched. You know, it'd be because your IGRs. Uh, and then lastly, it forces the adult females to prematurely drop their Uthekas. So if they are, you know, out in the open, it means that IGR was hit and they didn't have time to get back to the nest to drop their Utheka, you know, 24 to 48 hours before they're supposed to hatch. Uh, some of the ways to tell that they've been used, uh, we went over a couple of those except for the darker body colors. Uh, if you have IGRs used, a lot of times they won't be able to shed their skin as much. And because of that, a result is going to be that they'll have darker body colors. You'll still be able to see the mohawk in the back of their head. Uh, it'll just be darker, you know, but it'll still be there. Uh, last kind of treatment you know, I'm going to talk about will be dusting. And dusting... Uh, your different active ingredients will be a little bit different, um, but they are going to be odorless. You're not supposed to be able to tell, you know, the the dust. Uh, almost all of them are eco-friendly and safe. You know, there are some that are a little bit more heavy duty. Or the ones that are heavier duty will be more of a restricted use um, insecticide. Uh, so, I mean, you should be able to tell if it's restricted use or not when you're using it. It'll kill the insect without using highly toxic chemicals. You know, and that's highly toxic to us. They last for a very long time. Uh, some dusts, uh, depending on their matrix, will last for you know 10 to 15 years if applied correctly. If you apply it in an outlet cover or a wall void, it can last for way longer than that, for twice as long. Uh, you can treat areas that can't be reached, like a wall void, uh, and it's very effective when you use in conjunction with other treatment methods. You shouldn't only dust for a German roach treatment. If you're dusting for German roaches, you should be doing, you know, a, a liquid treatment or a baiting treatment or something, uh, something more than just dusting. Uh, it's called dusting for a reason. You're supposed to barely be able to see it if 
you had a dusting treatment and it looks like you're getting ready to roll out dough uh, because of, of all the dust you use. Don't do that. At least just pick it up. Uh, not only is it not aesthetically pleasing, it, it looks bad, uh, but if you're an insect, you're not going to want to climb over a mountain uh, of powder. You're going to want to walk over it. You want the insect to not even realize it's walking over dust. And that's kind of the point of it. And uh, your dusting, kind of just one quick note, uh, the, the difference between, you know, like a, a dust and a bait is more just your granule size in some instances. Uh, with your dusting. Uh, some of your dust is going to have a thicker particle size uh, and it's going to be more like a granular uh, a granular bait. That's what I mean, not, not a gel bait. Um, and so I would have a granular bait along with your dusting, but it is technically the same as dusting. It's just a, a stronger, a, a bigger particle size of what it is. Um, probably what I'm meaning with that um, like any of your dry flowables, a vert dry flowable, probably what people use the most often is what I'm talking about with uh, a dusting bait, you know, kind of a hybrid uh, between the two. And some of the examples of where you would want to dust uh, inside of outlets, you know, behind dividers, those dividers, if you pull them out, a lot of times you will see fecal matter back there. If there was a roach problem, you know, there's a spot that they like to go. Uh, hidden voids underneath, you know, like uh, right there, you can kind of get behind a drywall sometimes. That'd be a perfect spot for roaches to go to. Uh, cracks in concrete, where German roaches are at. Now, be smart if that's a small crack, then they might not be there. Um, or if it's a crack on the ground, wash off for foot traffic. Uh, and then folds and walls, uh, just a, a few, few spots that, uh, that you can treat dusting. Uh, if you do have any questions on any kind of treatment that you have, you know, always refer to your label first. You know, your label is going to have everything on there from your application directions, uh, storage, disposal, your application rates, uh, the different rules that you can have in a food establishment, not in a food establishment. All these questions can usually be answered on your label. So if you do have any questions, refer to that, you know, first, you know, and you should probably be able to, um, you know, be told what's going on there. Uh, now, lastly, when you're you're finishing your treatment process, I feel like this is a step that gets skipped a lot uh, because you treat, you think, okay, hey, I'm done. Let's wash my hands of it and walk away. Uh, this is an important step that you know will usually get mixed or missed. And, and what that is is cleaning up your treated area. Uh, you don't want to get there months later and and see you know your your monitors that you had when you first started your treatment. You, know, you don't want to have old cracked bait lined on top. Um, you, you don't want to have that. So you want to clean up all of those. Uh, further inspect all the German roach or where they're all found. Further inspect any activity. Um, this is a step that I always do personally. I, I would always set out additional monitors and I would always tell my technicians to set out additional monitors just to confirm uh, that the activity is gone. Uh, this is also a great peace of mind for, for customers. You know, if you were to set monitors out and say, yeah, for two weeks, I didn't catch one roach. That's a good peace of mind for them to say, yeah, the, the issue is actually taken care of instead of uh, let's go off of his word if it's taken care of. And that's it. There's no proof to show that it's gone other than you're, you're not seeing German roaches, but that doesn't necessarily mean the problem is gone. And then lastly, retreat if necessary. You know, sometimes you do have to retreat. You know, even the best technicians have to retreat sometimes, and it's it's okay to retreat. You know, it happens all the time. Uh, kind of an, an expectation uh, to set is most of your treatments uh, from start to finish should take anywhere from two to three weeks. Uh, if you catch a problem right in the beginning, you know, it's adolescence, you might be a little bit quicker than two to three weeks, you know, but... Uh, most of them will be anywhere from two to three, and they can take much longer. If you go to an apartment with a very well-established German roach problem, it'll take you a lot longer than three weeks. It can take you maybe months. So, I mean, uh, set the expectation level, you know, right in the beginning. Uh, my last slide uh, here for you this morning, uh, just some of the things that your customer can do uh, to help you out. Some things that you can say, you know, as a steward of your product, 
you know, let me give you some advice, you know, for your customer. Here's some of the conditions you have. Here's some notes to take back with you and tell your team. Uh, one is make sure key locations are on a regular sanitation schedule, you know, behind and underneath vending machines. It's it's uh, our jobs as technicians to point out some areas that might not be getting cleaned. It's our job to make sure that that schedule is being adhered to properly. Uh, we want to have it in our notes to say, you know, behind these vending machines, you know, it's showing on the schedule that it's being cleaned every week, but I've seen, you know, that the same trash back there for a few months. You know, we need to note that we need to do the CYA documentation type of stuff, right? Um, but it also gives you credibility, you know, in what you're doing, you know, um, all, all the different conditions. Maybe your your contact doesn't know about that, you know, or uh, your contact may not see the reports, you know, so you need to con or tell them in person rather than, you know, email it to them. Maybe the reports don't go to them and it goes to the accounting people. So your, your customer doesn't even see the reports. Um, so, I mean, communication is important. I'm kind of skipping ahead there. Sorry about that. Um, preventative measures. There are some preventative things that you can do uh, to try and stop with German roaches. One, have your contact, you know, our customers inspect all the incoming goods. You know, if you see some uh, German roaches are hitchhikers, so they get brought into facilities. If you see something that gets brought in with German roaches, reject that load. You know, you know it's it's okay to do that. Uh, one thing that I used to do in every place that had a break room and be surprised how much this took care of a problem. Um, the lunch boxes and things that employees would bring to facilities uh, in a break room, I would have all of the coolers that they would store their lunch boxes or all the lockers. I'd have it all on one side of the room. And I'd have all the vending machines, the ice maker, all that stuff, you know, on another side of the room or just away from the area that people would bring stuff. And then behind their shelves, I'd place two glue boards or glue monitors just to see if anything gets brought in. And, you know, so that was uh, one preventative thing that you can do, you know, kind of thinking outside the box a little bit to help you in your job and to kind of limit, you know, the, uh, the activity going on. And in that instance that I was talking about with, with the break room there, it kind of stops, stops the access from roaches or at least limits it as much as you can from them getting to the facility to you know the the ice machine that they want to get to you know kind of limits that whole thing and stops it in its tracks uh ceiling entrances around utility pipes you know prevents moistures uh build up i mean fixing cracks and holes limits the harborage areas uh, these are all things to try and stop them from being able to go from one place to another or having access to go to other uh, machines or rooms uh, and then lastly the cooperation and communication uh, benefits both the customer and and the pest management professional uh, and then you know ask ask the technician you know how, how you're doing do you have any recommendations and you as a technician to your contact here's some of the recommendations that you know i i think that you should do here's some conducive conditions that might turn into an issue here's some things that uh, you know i think we could be doing better you know ask your contact what can i be doing better you know, so uh, cooperation, communication go a very long ways. And so and with that, so I will we'll end the talk with German roaches. So thank you for.